So yeah, just gonna go check out this wall over here and answer the phone. Oh my god, what is that? This behemoth creature breaking through the wall is what is effectually known as Nemesis, because it will remain on your tail and a complete nemesis to you if pointed in your direction, no matter where you may run or where you may hide. This hulking beast is a combination of Umbrella USA and Umbrella Europe's work into creating the perfect BOW. But what combination is this and where might we specifically see Umbrella Europe's work later? Well, let's cover that in today's episode over Nemesis. But let me ask you a question. Do you want to get swole enough to take a Nemesis on by yourself? Well then my guy, you're gonna need yourself a good pair of earphones. That out of the way, the question mainly is, what is Nemesis? The creation of a Nemesis is a story of extreme trial and error and working with incomplete pieces of data. Umbrella Pharmaceutical's ultimate goal for this project was to create something capable of being sold to the US Army. With this, they plan to use the money to start creating the perfect humans or what could be considered perfect under their definition. As Umbrella continued to work on this project, eventually they would create a T-virus which was seen as a possible selling point. The issue was, however, due to degradation within the human brain, this would heavily affect the intellect of the person, decreasing their copacetic nature and ultimate rendering of them being just shambling beasts. This would mean they were essentially uncontrollable. During these projects, breakthroughs were made as such as with the Hunter Project, which we saw firsthand down in the sewers what they can do to a human if they get too close. But those were literal animals and had too many weaknesses and flaws flaws to be considered as sellable. So Umbrella held out for something that had none of the flaws but at minimum human-like intelligence, if not on par with human intelligence. Enter the Tyrant Project. The Tyrant Project's ultimate aim was to create human mutants without loss of intelligence. As Umbrella USA worked towards this end, Umbrella Europe would instead choose to look into parasites for the answer. These parasites would take over the function of the brain, creating a being who is as intelligent as a human. However, the two parts standing alone would run into problems and would reach impasses. The the Tyrant Project would not have a successful creation until the completion of the T-002 and the Nemesis Project had every host perish as none could actually survive this procedure. At this point, the USA team was feeling pretty good about the T-002s until a small police team showed up and decimated them by taking out the failed and outdated prototypes of the T-002 itself. After this, it became evident that there was going to be no great future for the T-002s if cops could just take them out. So they put the T-103s out the door toward Umbrella Europe to restart the Nemesis Project. These test subjects at this point were considered useless to some degree and were experimented on. More specifically with the NE alpha parasite. Having these implanted into their bodies, it would take over the brain functions and thus the host. Alarmingly to the scientists, however, two nemesis T-types gained an ego and a sense of self-awareness and made an attempt to escape the laboratory. This indicated that these experiments were much smarter than previously seen. So how did nemesis end up in Raccoon City? Well, considering Umbrella had, you know, a massive underground lab in the city, once they saw the outbreak happen, Happening, they viewed this as a good way to establish a sort of proof of concept. They began sending over the BOWs to take advantage of this crisis. UBCS were to engage the BOWs and monitors throughout the city were to report and record the BOWs combat skills to verify their reliability in open conflict. Umbrella also remembered that the STARS members who had attempted to take out their research previously, so they put a pursuer class nemesis on them and then showed this nemesis the photos of the surviving team members. It was instructed to take out the remaining members and was given a rocket launcher to show its proficiency with tools at its disposal. And we're also going to figure out if I was able to sneak past something that might be monitoring this channel here in a moment. So I'll let you guys know how that went. And this is where we officially get into Resident Evil 3. Well, the remake anyways. The remake ended up retconning a few things, so my intentions are to stick with this line of lore, as this is the most recent and intended canon of the series. If you haven't played the game, let me give you the briefest of rundowns. You are stalked throughout the entire city by a giant monster worse than Mr. Fedora Man who stalked Leon. This relentless beast appears to be more powerful than a T-103 and better at tracking due to its increased intelligence. But also, it has the ability to mutate and change in response to damage, just like a certain Dr. William Birkin. Interesting. But we'll get to those mutations soon. So there are three main mutation stages for the Nemesis. Humanoid, Quadrupedal, and Blobfish. Let's tackle each one and the surrounding events that push this creature towards its mutation over time. At the beginning, this thing relentlessly hunted Jill Valentine. Tracking her all over the city, there was really not not much she could do against it besides sort of just run in the opposite direction. But even while doing that, the creature's strength that it possessed was unimaginable. Able to jump down from seemingly nowhere, which was presumably the rooftops, it never injured itself in the process, and it also possessed tools at its disposal which could take her out at a moment's notice. All it would take is for her to get knocked down, and this creature would then bring its boot down on her in one fell swoop, completely crushing her skull. So in order to actually do this tracking and seeking, the nemesis needs intellect far beyond its predecessors. The human 
humanoid form, and subsequently every other form, is reliant upon the parasite within the body. Shortly after injection of the infant cellular form of parasite into the T103s, parasite would then move up to the brainstem of the creature and attach itself. As they mature, they would slowly eat through the brainstem connecting to the rest of the brain. There seems to be a common theme with sort of like being stuck inside your own head, because the brain was then isolated to just the skull and the parasites will become the new brain for the nemesis. The parasites possess their own intellect and human level intelligence, so they finally free the, uh, I guess, less intelligent organ, which was the brain, from the brainstem, and then they officially completely take over the body of the nemesis. Due to this, problem solving abilities increase once more, as does self awareness and rational thinking. The body of a humanoid nemesis, in terms of height, is roughly about the same as a tyrant. Standing about 7 feet 3 inches or 2.21 meters tall, this beast towers over any other human. The skin color of a nemesis is due to a chemical reaction of the alpha parasite. This brown staining and corroded tissue appears to be in direct conflict with the secretions, leading to its degradation, but its healing factor allows it to retain skin. Ironically, it appears that the secretions are also a part of this healing factor, or are really this healing factor, so they're sort of breaking down the skin, but then they're also building it. Concerning the actual morphology of the nemesis, it appears very much so to stem from being a human being. That said, the parasite has had some drastic effects on it, as well as the tyrant project. It's sort of hard to pinpoint exactly where each morphological trait comes from, but if you want to kind of like make your own comparisons, I do have a video over Mr. Explained, nailed it, which I will link at the end. That said, we can see that they are roughly the same height, likely the same strength as a tyrant, but the healing factor is something Mr. X did not appear to have as he was taken out by Birkin. Nemesis does actually appear to have this healing factor because of the parasite, which has changed him on a cellular level, and I'm just gonna go ahead and say I think Nemesis could totally wreck Dr. Birkin, but regardless of that, this may explain the gigantic teeth. This would say to me there are a few things going on, but we will get to that momentarily. So first, let's talk about just the overall powerhouse that Nemesis is. Nemesis possesses a superhuman strength, which has given him the ability to leap great heights as well as smash through apartments, floors, buildings in general, lift cars. So you can kind of imagine what he can do to your body with just a kick. This also has given him the ability to lift tools that are usually strapped and bolted down to vehicles. The strength also translates into speed. The humanoid nemesis, as well as the quadrupedal, can easily outrun any human. Its bulky appearance may make you think it should be slower, but due to all this strength, it is able to appropriate the muscle strength to make it faster. This gives the prey much less time to react, and in turn, Nemesis chooses to run at opponents head on and bludgeon them to their end. But with these two abilities, I mean, that's great and all, but without durability, it would be useless. Think of it as like a glass cannon scenario. But much like the other tyrants, Nemesis can ignore direct hits to his body and head. And considering the brain is no longer in control, this is completely understandable why he can take, I don't know, any hit to the head and be perfectly fine. And this is because taking out the brain of the Nemesis does nothing, besides maybe affect its ability to see, but the brain is no longer running the show, so the parasites are all over the body, and those are what's actually kind of piloting it, I guess you could say. So that said though, with enough concussive force imparted into its body, it will stun it, but it will not take it out concerning what you can actually hold. So we can see that these parasites in its body actively come out during a chase scene with Jill Valentine, and these parasites have the ability to manipulate large portions of the body and create long tentacles used to grab and hold onto humans around him. These tentacles further increase the lethality of this beast, as it can use these to grasp onto objects, helping it climb. And this also might explain why we always see him kind of appearing on rooftops out of nowhere. These same parasites also affect the mitotic pathways within the body, increasing its ability to heal, and due to its training, it's a skilled combatant to boot. But alright, let's get into how this thing actually heals, because I know what you guys are really here for, and that is the science. I mean, I'm sure the sultry sounds of my voice are just perfect, but let's just go ahead and move on. So seeing that this parasite exists all throughout the body, these secretions are likely a form of MPF, or maturation promoting factor. The proteins responsible are CDK1 and cyclin B. Essentially, these will activate the mitotic pathways within cells and lead to rapid cellular division. This is secreted all over the body, but it would also appear it can be localized. Having this secretion factor in areas of damage after an engagement with Jill leads to the ability for it to keep pushing and tracking. In other areas, such as jumping off buildings, this would more than likely cause little micro fractures within the bone, so this would activate the osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are responsible for bone formation and are prevalent during fractures. So, like I said, I would assume the laws of physics still apply, so that much force imparted into bones, as well as the concussive force and absorption from, like, say, a grenade, would mean that the body would need to heal rapidly to maintain integrity. So I know what you're saying, so Roanoke, with the mitotic pathways all activated, is this really any different from cancer? Well, you'd actually be right. Judging by the teeth and skin degradation, 
Foundation, it does appear that Nemesis is about just on the cusp of certain bone cancers as well as continued growth. The skin looks straight up melanoma, meaning there are some issues, but the reason it's not a massive cancer, which we will see later, is likely due to an inhibitor to the mitotic pathways being released as well. Because healing is great, but uncontrolled healing is more damaging than anything. We can actually see that this unchecked healing after major damage is presented. When Mikhail detonates the C4 on the train to take out Nemesis, this coupled with all other engagements sends him into a heavily damaged state. He ends up stumbling out of the train station later and falling into the river. Here is where the T-virus begins to rear its ugly head. Due to Nemesis being infected with T-virus, but more specifically the parasite, kind of causes these things to work in conjunction. The parasite appears to be able to heal the body, but is unable to maintain a humanoid state. The regenerative abilities go haywire and completely change this creature to a more animalistic origins. So much like when William Birkin started becoming more beast-like over time after injecting the G-virus, the changes to the physical form of Nemesis also appears to be quite high. And here's where we can officially start with the feet, because we could have, I guess, with the humanoid, but I mean, it's just a foot. So we see with this particular mutation, it has completely changed them. Continuing with the almost cancerous levels of bone growth, the big toe strangely hasn't grown as much as the others have, but is it really that strange, and why is this the case? Well, within mammals, there's something called a dew claw. The dew claw usually resides higher up on the foot than the other four toes, being longer and actually making contact with the ground. Well, so the other four toes make contact contact. The dew claw never makes contact and it's called dew claw because when they walk through the grass it gets wet by dew. So just like any other animal the foot has a ditch to grade structuring and as a result is much longer with the heels never touching the ground. The trench coat originally worn is now in tatters and I have been told by others this has the added effect originally of controlling mutations within the tyrants. So it can be assumed that this trench coat was supposed to do the same thing before being heavily damaged by the explosion. Moving up the chest we can see that the tyrants vulnerabilities are still very much so present. The large secondary heart added comes out of the chest to take over the duties of the smaller human heart, meaning that the rib cage likely does not have a sternum present after the mutation. The muscle mass in this creature has also greatly increased, meaning that it is now even stronger than before. The arms are several feet in length and work more as legs now as the creature runs around in a quadrupedal feral state. Interestingly, these mutations appear to have the effect of decreasing the overall intelligence of this beast, so it makes it more aggressive but at the cost of calculated thought. The head of the the second stage appears strangely much more smooth and muscular. At this point, the skin appears to be much more stretched and kind of slimy looking, and the head has also grown to about the proportionate size of the body. The mouth has several teeth in it, more than it initially had, or at least that's the way it looks, but you can't deny that perfect smile. And you know what? This thing honestly looks like Alien from Alien if you get a good look at it. Large muscles on the face now get a powerful bite, presumably, should anyone get too close. And if you do get too close, it can basically rip off your entire face. So continuing with the mutations, originally had having two arms, this creature ends up losing one after Jill drops a massive gate onto it, severing it. The creature rides around, but almost at a metabolically impossible healing time, no wait, it, it's basically metabolically impossible because it would end up cooking itself, it grows a tentacle-like appendage and fires an infecting spike into Jill's arm to change her. Over time, the tentacle continues to grow and becomes strong enough to become its main offensive means. As the damage continues to mount, more was expected from the Nemesis's healing factor. Upon being submerged in an extremely corrosive chemical, the body had to quickly divide and continue dividing, otherwise the cells would be eaten up entirely by the chemicals. This would eventually lead to the chemical mixture being more and more diluted, until ultimately the creature was able to overtake the chemical reaction and continue dividing cells into more numbers than it was actually burning, which meant that now it was on the positive side of building its body back up. Upon doing so, a new ability began to take hold. The third blobfish form I mentioned earlier due to all the damage incurred from the acid bath, and this meant that no form was going to be taken and instead it began to absorb those infected with the T-virus around it, notably all the zombies and hunters that were present in the room after its bath. The introduction of new cellular material, more T-virus, and the experiments associated with the hunters meant that all this combined ended up changing the Nemesis into a room-sized beast. Nemesis sadly in this form has no feet to start with and instead has two large multi-segmented arms it uses to attack its target. Interestingly, it still has a head which has grown into massive proportions as likely this is the stronghold of the parasites, but it's now having multiple rows of teeth, and one bite from it, as to be expected, can instantly end a human. This rapid growth, though, has created weak points on the body of blisters. Taking these out and damaging the creature opens up the rib cage, exposing the heart, but only by giving it the finger can you actually harm it. Eventually, Jill is able to overcome this constantly mutating beast by utilizing these experimental tools and blowing it apart. This is likely the end as it takes out the stronghold of the parasites within the brainstem, but perhaps even given enough time, it may have recovered to some degree.
degree. However, a nuclear detonation completely vaporized the body entirely, leading it to its ultimate end. But one thing I did want to discuss before we wrap this up, and I talked about it earlier in a video, is the actual parasite. So just to recap, this is what separates a nemesis from an actual T-103. These parasites not only have the ability to infect Jill through a shot to the arm, and can also infect Jill by completely latching onto her head, and I would have to assume it just takes her head off and then interfaces with the brainstem. But it can also be seen when Nemesis attaches the parasite to the head of an infected person with a T-virus. But let me know if you want like a more in-depth analysis on the parasites, because they also seem to greatly sort of resemble the Las Plagas. So now we got to get to the, um, let's call it just morbid curiosity that every human has. So how does a Nemesis take you out? Well, it really depends on the form. With the humanoid form, punching and a skull crushed with a foot are pretty standard. It's also known to just pick you up and completely crush your head with its hands or use tentacles that can uh, go through your spinal cord and sever those connections. But when it punches you, imparting this much force can easily snap spines, cause internal hemorrhaging, as well as brain contusions and brain bleeding. But as this creature gets larger, simply by running into you or swiping you with claws can take you out. But it usually prefers to just jump on you and bite. And this remains a theme throughout the other interactions as well. When it turns into its blobfish form, if it's able to grab you, that's it, man. It's just one bite and I assume it rips off like half your body. But I want to thank you guys for watching. If you did enjoy, leaving a like helps and subbing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. All right, so the purple channel is growing. If you want to check that out, I would be greatly appreciative because I'm just trying to keep this thing moving, I guess. If not, well, that's all right too. I'll drop the links to that as well as Discord, Twitter, Patreon, and my other channel links. And I would like to thank my patrons real quick. Huge shout out to our astronauts, It's Not a Spoon and Trey Windenall. Thank you guys for your massive support. And I'd also like to thank Skilt, our lone scientist. And to the rest of my patrons, I really do appreciate your support during this time. It goes a long way towards keeping this channel up and running. And honestly, I couldn't do without y'all. So all right, that's gonna do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed and I will see y'all in the next one.